we came up to Seattle uh, to Fort Lewis and at Fort Lewis I started a soccer team uh, with the help of a colonel, a Colonel Bezik and I got on special duty. I was in the MPs with the 4th Infantry Division. I got on special duty, so all I did was coach soccer. Uh, and then I ended up getting picked for the US SISM team, which is like the military Olympics. And I went over to Germany, to, to Stuttgart, and we played on this team there. It was basically, uh, players from all over the United States, uh, different nationalities. And it was coached by a guy that I happen to know in England, a guy called Billy Elliott, used to play for Sunderland. We had actually 24 guys on the squad, and I think there was uh, about 23 different nationalities. And uh, as a matter of fact, every one of them, or every one of the soccer team, ended up going to Vietnam, except for me and uh, an American. Everybody else went, and a couple of them didn't make it back. It played in the state league, yeah. We had a, we we uh, used to play our home games at, uh, actually on Fort Lewis, right uh, on the main, the main parade field. And the funny thing about it, I said to the colonel, hey, we need some goal nets. So we ended up with goal nets, but they were camouflage nets. So, so here's the goals. People come up and you see these camouflage nets at the back of the goals. So it was pretty funny. When we first started playing, get, playing our games at Woodland Park, it was a dirt field. And they never used to have any nets in those days. And sometimes you could shoot and you didn't know if the referee wasn't really close, you couldn't tell whether the ball went in the net or out, out, in the goals or outside the goals. And a lot of times there was quite a few arguments about it. But uh, the funny thing about it was they used to put a rope around the field in those days and all the spectators had to stand behind the rope. And even in, in those days, you'd probably get anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people on a Sunday watching these games. And Ed Craggs, the senior, he would run a, walk around with a little box for donations. And that's how the league supported itself. So I had to fight to basically to get myself released from Tacoma so I could go and play for Fort Lewis. Okay. And then when I got, when I got out of the, the army, uh, Balin Dutz, he was the uh, owner of the Hungarians. He used to have a bakery in Burien. He was paying me really big money, $25 a game. <laughs> well, probably, well, it, was, it was the only team probably getting paid, wasn't it? Yeah, well, uh, I think every, most of the players got a little bit from him because he had quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Mike Kutsi and Zoli Mako were getting paid. Mm -hmm. Now you had played against the Hungarians to that point, so you must have a, a lot of respect for the, that club. When you yeah, well, it. they, I, I thought they were an excellent team, and obviously they thought I was a pretty good player because they, when I got out of the army, they came for me. So and, tell me the style. They're not all Hungarians because you're not Hungarian. Uh, but uh, what had been your experience? Uh, that was probably the most successful team for about 10 years there with, with the Hungarians. Uh, what's it like playing with them? What's the team uh, character? Well, the funny thing about it, when actually when I was, our first game uh, at Fort Lewis was against the Hungarians and <clears throat> everybody, had, I had never seen them and everybody told me how good they were. I hadn't seen them. And, uh, I, had, I knew we had a pretty good team, and so after about 15 minutes, the Hungarians were leading two to nothing, and the people that had come down to watch the game were saying, "Oh, same old shit. Uh, Hungarians are going to win this thing, no problem." Well, the score ended up we beat them eight to two, 
because I, I got my team to settle down and start playing soccer, and that was the first time the Hungarians had ever been beaten by that big a score. And so uh, that started a real big rivalry for the league. And watching the Hungarians, the thing that I noticed that they did, they, everybody that got the ball always wanted to dribble. Nobody was just playing one and two touch. Uh, and this is probably why we beat it. We had a couple of people that liked to dribble, but the rest of the time, we were playing one and two touch. Uh, so when I got to the Hungarians, um, I very rarely used to dribble. I was usually winning the ball in midfield and playing it to whoever was open and trying to get them to to change their style was very difficult, but eventually uh, I got to enjoy it, even though the first few weeks I didn't because of the way they played. Um, and they, they did change slightly, but not a lot. They still wanted to dribble. Uh, but it was very, very enjoyable, and we had a very good team. Even while I was playing, I was coaching kids. Uh, I started in Greenwood, and my wife, my first wife, had gone down to the school because uh, there was some meeting there, and they wanted to de decide what would things would do for the kids. So my wife had said, oh, my husband would love to coach kids. So she comes home and tells me, she says, oh, you're going to be coaching kids. So I go out there and there's like two kids. I says, well, where's all these kids that we've got to coach? So, oh, you've got to go and find them. So I used to go out on the streets and say, hey, son, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. Oh, come on, you're coming in here. And we used to go to the school playground, which is Greenwood Elementary, and start soccer. And we ended up getting a team together and I had no interest in winning. All my interest was in coaching the kids. Whereas these other teams, they, they were desperate to win. Oh, we won six games this year. We won eight games. My first year, we didn't win a game. And then second year, that's when we started winning. And the, the kids were obviously taught to play soccer. I had parents on the sidelines shouting, kick it, kick it, kick it. And I used to go up to the parents and say, hey, shut it. I'm coaching these kids, and you, they don't kick it, they pass it. And so they all learned from me. And of course, I used to swear at the kids. And parents used to say to me, oh, I, I can't do that at, at home. I can't swear at them. I said, well, they hear more swearing from everybody than they will from me. So it's no big deal. And it got to the stage that the parents loved me. They thought, because all the kids respected me, and they thought that that was great. And Bill Logie had basically all of the state select team except for two players. And those other two players played for me. That was my son and a guy called Jerry Cameron. And so when we got to the final playing against Bill Logie's team, Nobody gave us a chance because he had just basically the state select him. And for the two weeks before the game, I knew we were compatible with him. I mean, we had skill. And I said, you're not going to beat these guys unless you're fit. So for two weeks, all we did was run around Green Lake twice, then run up some inclines oh, 20 or 30 times to get him fit, and then we'd spend an hour playing head tennis on the tennis courts at Woodland Park. And when we got to the game, we were getting beat one to nothing, and the last 20 minutes of the game, the other team never touched the ball because we were just so much fitter, and we ended up winning two to one. So uh, everybody's happy. Uh, Jerry Cameron is so happy about it that he's got the, uh, the cup with him. 
and they're all going. I said, okay, we're all going to go for pizza. So Jerry, Jerry Cameron was a driver, uh, even though he was only, I think he was 16, and even though he was under 19, but most of my team was 16 years old. And uh, Jerry Cameron puts the cup on the roof of the car, gets in the car and forgets about it, and drives off. And of course, the cup ended up hitting the ground and got smashed up. So it cost me a couple of hundred dollars to get it repaired. <laughs> I started Greenwood Soccer Club and I never got anybody come in and help because if anybody had ever come in to me and said, hey, you're not coaching this team no more, yeah, there would have been a problem. Huh? So I was coaching three teams at one time uh, with, uh, with the Greenwood team. And then I, I ended up getting one of uh, a Norwegian guy. He was actually my accountant. Uh, he came to help me and he took over one of the teams. But many a time on a Sunday, I've seen it where we had a game at 10 o'clock in the morning. I would load all the kids in my car. I'd have 18 kids in my car, cramped. It was just a regular car, regular sedan. We'd be cramped, get to the game, finish the game, bring them back, load up another bunch of kids, take them to a game. And that's what it was like. That's all I used to do on a Sunday. And so obviously I was looking for people to help. And it eventually turned out real good. And then when we won the league, uh, the championship, then uh, that was the last of my coaching. I said, that's it, I'm done. Mike Ryan was probably the most passionate about the game. I mean, Walter Smetzer loves the game, but Mike Ryan, it just bubbles over with him. He, once you started talking about soccer with him, you couldn't shut him up. He, was, he wasn't a great player. Mike wasn't a great player. He used to love to play. Uh, but um, he, he just wanted to talk about soccer all the time. And he knew all the different players. He could say, oh, this player from Manchester United, this player from Ireland, this player from Germany. He knew them all and he could tell you everything about them. And that's what I respected about Mike. Uh, he, he just wanted to be involved in soccer all the time. And like I say, he wasn't that great a player, and it just proves that you don't have to be a good player to be a good coach. You have to know something about the game. Mm -hmm. I love the players that I played with, uh, players at Fort Lewis. Uh, I don't stay in contact with too many of them. Uh, Tadios, of course, is here, and every once in a while, you get people from the East Coast that were with us in the Army on the team come over, and uh, they'll visit me at the pub. Uh, Walter Smetzer, who's always been a good friend and a, a very good player. Uh, there's other players that I used to really think were great, with Zoli Mako, was always a perfect gentleman, but sadly Zoli passed away a few years ago. Uh, and it's uh, it, terrible, which obviously, but it happens, it's supposed to happen. Everybody only has a certain amount of time in this world. And uh, it's, I hate to see people that we used to play with pass on. And uh, I hope that when I go, there's a lot of people that will thank me and remember me for doing what I did.